Kowalski. The Outdoor Drive Podcast. All right. Welcome back to the Outdoor Drive Podcast. Yet another episode. This is episode 199. We are one away from 200. And man, do we have a special one for you on 200. Not what you guys are expecting, but a really, really good one. So stay tuned for that one. This is your boy, East Coast Trev, and I'm joined by my good buddy, Mr. Madman Mardik. Oh, oh, Madman, you there? I'm here. Oh, okay. Are you there? Oh, yeah. No, I just decided I was going to cut you off of this one just because I didn't want you to be on it. You just muted me? Yeah, that's it. Screw it. I don't don't need you. Right, right. (laughs) And, of course, we got our good buddy, Mr. Justin Barnes. What's up, dude? What's up, gentlemen? Oh, man. How are you? Thanks for joining us on this one, man. Oh, yeah. Pleasure. I think we... We, we, we owed this one to you, so we figured we'd give it to you one away from 200. You're not good enough for 200, but we'll give it to you at 199. <laughs> what is that? Is that all right? Oh, I'm close. That's an honor. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's sweep up the corners, do, do some housekeeping, and then we'll get right into Justin, um, and we'll have a good old uh, BS session with our, with our man. What do you say? Good up. All right. First off, Huntworth, HuntworthGear.com. As you guys all know, we all run Huntworth. Get more for less. Some of the best camo on the market. What do you think about it, Justin, since you've been running it one oh. uh, turkey season? So up at turkey camp, me and Steve were sitting on an edge, and we had birds come up to about spit distance, and that sealed the deal for me, man. It was it was insane. I had the tarnin on. He had the disruption. It didn't matter. We both blended in. They didn't even know we were there, so that was a game changer for me. Hell yeah. Nor'easter game calls, nor'easter game Uh, get them in close. The grunt tubes. There's a couple on the website right now for sale. Uh, and we'll have the rest of them here at hunt stock on August 12th, 13th, 14th and 15th or 13th, 14th. I don't know. I'm not good with dates, but somewhere we'll be at hunt stock that weekend is. <laughs> and nor- nor'easter game calls will be there with us. Um, and last but not least, Bowhunters United, bowhuntersunited.com. Um, they will bring us news for your crews with our good buddy, Mr. Mike Salter. Let's take a break. We'll take it over to him. After our fine word from Mr. Mike Salter, we'll get back to the podcast. All right, guys. Why don't we buckle up and see what's going on in the world of news with Mr. Mike Salter. Hey everyone, we're going to kick this one off in New York where the Department of Environmental Conservation has announced that the fall pheasant season will proceed as planned. Earlier this year, the DEC lost their pheasant flock at the Reynolds Game Farm due to an outbreak of highly pathogen- pathogenic avian influenza. The DEC will be acquiring both young and adult pheasants from a commercial hatchery to be raised at the Reynolds Game Farm until they are ready for stocking this fall. Now to Wyoming, where the Game and Fish Department has opened a public comment period and will be holding public meetings across the state on changes to three chapters of hunting regulations. Those include Chapter 2, uh, General Hunting Regulations, Chapter 28, Regulation Governing Big or Trophy Game Animal or Game Bird or Gray Wolf Damage Claims, and Chapter 42, Mountain Lion Hunting Seasons. Eight public meetings will be held on the proposals. June 26th at Sheridan Game and Fish Regional Office at 5 p.m., June 29th at Casper Game and Fish Regional Office at 6 p.m., July 6th at Laramie Game and Fish Regional Office at 6 p.m., July 11th at Cody Game and Fish Regional Office at 6 p.m., July 11th at uh, Lander Game and Fish Regional Office at 6 p.m., July 19th at Green River Game and Fish Regional Office at 6 p.m., July 20th at Jackson Game and Fish Regional Office at 6 p.m., and July 26th at Pinedale Game and Fish Regional Office at 6 p.m. Written comments will be accepted through 5 p.m. on August 4th, which can be submitted uh, at any of the meetings by mailing Wyoming Game and Fish or by submitting online. Written comments will be presented to the Game and Fish Commission prior to their September meeting. Now to Alabama, where the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources will be increasing CWD sampling surveillance efforts in southeast Alabama after confirmation of a CWD positive deer in Holmes County, Florida. The ADCNR will deploy additional self service drop off CWD sampling freezer locations throughout southeast Alabama and increase surveillance efforts. During deer season, hunters are encouraged to provide deer heads for CWD sampling, and the public is being asked to report roadkill deer and deer displaying unusual behavior to your local WFF office. Now for a study uh, conducted by the Responsive Management for the Outdoor Stewards of Conservation Foundation, 
which looked to gain insight into the current attitudes of adult Americans regarding fishing, target shooting, hunting, and trapping. The project was a continuation of similar studies conducted by Responsive Management and provides trend data dating back to 1995. Unfortunately, the results are painting an ominous picture for those in the outdoor space. General popula uh, population support of these activities has declined, including a 3% decline in support of recreational fishing and target shooting, and a 4% decline in support of hunting. The percentages may seem small, but the study is representative of 253 million adult Americans, with 4% equaling 10.1 million people. Uh, the executive director of response management stated the findings are worrisome, but having this knowledge will allow the industry to make changes to stem or reverse the loss of support. And the most important things we can do next is learn the specific reasons why Americans no longer approve of these activities at the rates they used to. In my opinion, this shows now more than ever that it is on sportsmen and women to bring positive light on these activities uh, that are so important to us. The full study can be found on OutdoorStewards.org if you want to take a look at it. Now the Boone and Crockett Club and the NRA's Hunters Leadership Forum uh, have now partnered to develop an online education platform to teach hunter ethics. The Fair Chase Hunter Ethics curriculum is to help communicate the importance of fair chase ethics when hunters are afield and will complement existing NRA hunter education modules to carry a positive message to new and existing hunters and the general public. This online course is expected to launch in early 2024. Now to Iowa, where the Woods and Waters Project is looking for women interested in archery to join Archer uh, at Bonanza on the mountain. They are offering 10 spots for a six-week program for beginner and intermediate archers. They will meet once, sometimes twice per week in the evenings for shooting instruction and practice to prepare for the 3D archery course at sundown in Dubuque, known as Bonanza. Uh, the instructional sessions will start July 11th at Anim Animosa Bowhunters, and will uh, they will hold an initial meeting the week before uh, with drinks, food, gear, and intros. The program does cost $150, which includes the six-week six -week archery program, weekend ticket to Bonanza, camping at Bonanza, Animosa Bowhunters membership, a t-shirt, and more. If you don't have a bow, don't worry. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to set up with and use a bow for the entire program. To sign up, contact Steph Lane via email at hello at woodsandwatersproject.com. Lastly, to Connecticut, another state record fish. This time, Bill Prolux, sorry if I butchered your last name, uh, with a new state record summer flounder. Bill's fish tipped the scales at 15.3 pounds and 35 and 5 eighths inches long with a girth of 26 and a quarter inches. The fish surpasses the previous record of 14 pounds, 13.76 ounces, and 31 and a half inches caught by Michael Mufucci in 2019. So congrats to Bill on an absolute slob of flounder. Also, don't forget to click on the Outdoor Drives affiliate link in the episode description and sign up for Bowhunters United today to protect and expand your bowhunting rights. As always, if you have any news to send along to me, reach out to me at Mike Salter on Facebook or Bearded underscore Bowhunter21 on Instagram. With that, enjoy the rest of your ride. All right. Thanks, Mr. Mike, and thank you, Bowhunters United. For you guys that didn't sign up, the link is down below. Right down below, you guys can sign up for that and uh, get yourselves on for the people that, you know, that do some stuff for us as bowhunters. And we're all bowhunters, so do some stuff. There you go. Right over there, bowhuntersunited.com. Um, all right. Now that we got all that stuff up and out of the way, Justin, what is up, bro? Why don't we uh, – let's turn the key. Some of them kind of know who you are, but uh, let's turn the key, man. Why don't you tell everybody who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about, you know, kind of what you do. My name's Justin Barnes. I'm from Massachusetts originally. <clears throat> I live in New Hampshire now, southern New Hampshire. I'm a carpenter by trade. And, man, I love the outdoors. Yeah, yeah, that you do. Not only as a big deer killer, but also a, a bass fisherman, too, and a fisherman. You know, spend a lot of time fishing and stuff. And Oh, yeah, my hands still smell like fish right now. Me and the wife were out enjoying the sun and getting the lines wet. Caught a couple before this. It was a blast. That's awesome, dude. And I, it's just, it's, it's cool because like the, the mixture of people that we have on the team, Justin is, is one of the team members here in the outdoor drive and, and he's like our freshwater guru. Cause he, he's always out catching large mouths or whatever, man. I mean, you just, we never even know when you're out. We just get a Snapchat. Justin's out on the water. Like <laughs> best way to kill time, man. It is. Relax. And separates turkey and deer. Sit back, relax. Getting trail cam picks. Oh no, no, uh, no trail cam picks. 
No, yeah, I'm just going one in right now, but nothing and big. Nothing uh, big. <laughs> do, no. you, do you have any targets yet? Anything that's potential <laughs> looking one. forward? I got one. Not going to go too in depth about it, but you guys stick with us and you'll see. Yeah. I, what do you, you got trail cameras out already? I thought it was too early for that stuff. Uh, the ones that the lithiums hang on until now, they're still out. Yes, uh, I always have them out, man. I don't take them out of the woods, ever. I don't feel as if there's any need to take them out of the woods. If they're still going to run, let them run. You can get that right. some, some crazy intel never, that way. It makes it I'll good. ship them around. I'll shift them around a little bit depending on what time of year it is, or sometimes I'll shift them around just for turkey or something like that, but they're still in the woods. Yeah. That's one thing I picked up on with you. You were utilizing them for turkey, and I'm like, you know what? It's not a bad idea at all. Yep. The thing you is, gotta you just got to put them lower. That's the, one of the only things when you're going to turkey hunt with them is you, you have to definitely put them lower because you are not going to get the same reaction out of them. For yeah. sure. And, and, it's not easy to figure out where turkeys are going to be on camera often. I mean, maybe on like a, on a green field or something like that, that they're constantly hitting, but like you get in the timber, I mean, logging roads and maybe like Oak flats and stuff like that. But they're, they're tricky to catch on camera on a regular basis. It's, it's funny as you see on social media, guys have a ton of pictures of turkeys and stuff. And you're like, how did you get that picture of him strutting? Like, how did you know where he was going to be? Like, bro, there's gotta yeah. be some, you're doing something. Like, how do you get that yeah. picture? It's just luck of the draw. Just knowing those strutting areas. Lucky with that was, um, Seth out in that little pasture, man. He had that bird strutting almost every day. Well, that's because he, he drives down to the field every single day and watches the birds and then puts his camera in correlation to where he had seen that bird constantly. And it, it, But you see the guys like them strutting in the woods, and you're like, bro, how did you know that that thing was going to strut right there that you could get a picture on? Yeah, that, that's definitely hard. So, man, I have pretty good – oh, sorry. I, I was just going to say I have pretty decent luck where I am for that. Only, well, Trev, you've been there before. Yeah, it's, sure. like, it's like – the, just because of the train feature and it's like this one flat where it's kind of like when it was logged, it was like where they laid down all the logs. So it's kind of like a little clearing and it's just like the only one little opening on an oak flat. So it only makes sense that that's where they want to go out there and strut their stuff and it usually works out for me. But again, they could be 50 yards to the left and I'll never see them. That's the same with whitetails though. Whitetails could be the same thing. You just, I guess you're just guessing to where you want them to be, right? I mean, I don't know. And so they stop frequent scrape or take over a particular area, man. They float. They're hard. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. to try and get that, like that certain area where, dude, is that guy? Oh, sorry, I'm down at the local, the local uh, like park, and I thought someone was live lining a pumpkin seed, but I, he was just catching the pumpkin seed. So <laughs> I was like, yo, he knows some stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, break it down for us, man. Where did where did the outdoors kind of kind of where did you start in the outdoors? Like, where did it all start for you? Did you come from a hunting family and just kind of it kind of you just kind of bled into it, or how how was it for you, man? Yep. So I come from a big hunting family. My uncles and obviously my father started up in Vermont. My grandparents lived up there. Well, great grandparents. So that was like their getaway to go hunting and fishing. So. My dad had me in a car seat with a fishing rod in my hand, so I started fishing before I did anything. And then he would come home with a deer, a dead deer, and once I started picking up on that, I got old enough around five, six, and I'm like, oh, I like that, you know? So as soon as I could pull a bow back where I could kill something is when I really got into it. I think I was 13 with a little Parker and didn't see much because obviously – the knowledge we have now is insane. So it was basically get out of school, put the camera over your clothes, jump up in the ladder stand in the middle of the wide open and just give it help. But it grew on me and it really started to get serious and take over fishing. Basic every, my life turned into deer hunting. Cause it was, I don't know. It's the most addictive thing ever. <laughs> and senior year going into college is when all hell broke loose and, but turned into a madman junior. <laughs> <laughs> Is that really where you got the itch that time of year, man? Like what, what was kind of that, that changing point for you? Cause I know like myself was like constantly going to the same ladder stand all the time, hunting the same exact properties. And then there was just that switch. Like, 
I want to mobile hunt. I want to chase big white tails. Like, where was that for so, you? Um, it was actually my senior year. I shot my first 10 pointer out of a ground blind, a fallen down tree that I cut a bunch of limbs out of. And I sat on a little tripod chair and it was an October morning, real foggy. I put out a bunch of, I didn't really know what I was doing. Bunch of estrus on a tampon, hung it out in front of me. Bang, shot a deer that morning. When I walked up to a 215-pound buck with a big rack on and picked it up, I was amazed, absolutely amazed. And that was like the, the switch. It was like, I need to do this every single year, which is hard, but I want to do it every year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So then it turned how can I change up stands? Um, am I even shooting the right arrow? Like my bow, I need a new bow. I need this, I need that. And then it was just a snowball effect. And that's normally how it happens. Like you get that first itch of of real rutting big bucks, and then you're just like, okay, how do I do this again? Like how do I re and redo that all over again? Yeah. I called everybody I knew who supported me hunting. I'm like, you guys aren't gonna believe this. Like you need to come here now. I don't care what you're doing, firstborn, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then you want to do it you want to do it a hundred times over now the thing that makes it kind of crazy for like the area that you hunt in new england is that there is no public land like everything or there it might be a little bit of public land but everything is like a trespass where like you can go wherever you want and not have it's like if it's not posted you can hunt it correct so how yep. do you go about like in your daily like right now we'll, we'll take it from like early season like knowing that you can pretty much hunt anywhere. What are you looking for to try and go, like, to go and find a really good spot to find a big buck? Um, well, granted, I've hunted for this long now. I have all my main spots. But if I was fresh off, I would open up Spartan Forge. And I look for natural, big natural funnels, almost like we, I live in suburbs. I mean, now I'm a little more north, so it gets a little more open. But... I'm looking big valleys that are going to come into a pinch or a giant development over there. And then a half a mile away is another something that's going to segue these deer into a, a specific spot of woods and not necessarily get on them early season. But when they start moving and they keep checking scrapes and then it's daylight movement, just put yourself in position for one to come by, you, mm -hmm. you know? And do you find that that having that law to be able to hunt any property that you want virtually if it's not posted, do you think that that's a plus or a minus in your hunting? Oh, definitely a plus. And that's just because you can pretty much move on anything if you find that a deer is in one area to be able yeah. to move on it somewhere else? or Sure. I mean, th there are people around that do post soup to nuts, you know what I mean? And it kind of stinks sometimes because you'll be on – a great deer that really has your attention and then he's frequenting a heavily posted property. And it's like, how much time can I really spend waiting on him to come out? So that's when you kind of got to draw the line. And sometimes you got to X it and on to the next, but with the non posted land, it's, it's free. It's basically public. If you want to look at it that way, some people feel uncomfortable, but I mean, rules, rules. Yep. No. And, and I think, I don't know, like I, you know, I think about it all the time and like here, like you are so stuck to one area or then getting permission in certain areas that like you, I kind of get mad because I'm like, I really want to hunt there, but I can't get permission there where like with you, you're like, OK, I can hunt there. It's not posted. I'm going in there and hunting. So I guess it's you can definitely find yourself putting yourself in position for bigger deer a little bit more frequently or easily. Right, I guess. Oh, for sure. I could never imagine if I opened up Spartan Forge and there was a property line that I can't even see a rock wall or anything. And you're like, I can't go 15 hours this way. It's illegal. I'd be like, damn. Yeah, that's got to be Tough. miserable. I like, It is miserable. I, it's not that it, it's like miserable. It is miserable. I mean, what do you think, Steve? Like, what is your input on that? My biggest thing, my biggest fear would be because it's non-posted land you have to be even more hush hush about what you're on because any other guy can come in behind you and hunt that non posted land. So I run into it a little bit. Trev runs into it. Justin, I'm sure you run into it a little bit. People start recognizing your truck. And when they see your truck parked in the same spot, three, four days, 
there's a reason why you're in there. You're not in there hunting at six pointer. Like if Justin Barnes is in there, there's a damn good reason why he's in there. And then people start getting nosy and, you know, want to see what's up. So, you know, yep. I always worry about that stuff. So like where we are, it's either public or private. So, you know, I say I have a buck on one particular piece of private. I know all the surrounding property, whether it's huntable or not huntable, that they give permission or don't. I can be a little bit more free. I, you know, I could show you a trail camera picture because you ain't getting within five miles of that deer, mm -hmm. but you because know, you just you're not getting permission. Um, with with that open open space, uh, anybody could slide in there. It's basically public land at that at that point. So I would be more worried about that. I think. So you definitely have to keep your stuff a little bit more hush hush. You're not sharing your your pictures of one fifties with your buddy. That's not happening. No. Oh, start, start unless, that hunt. unless it's you guys or one, right one or two people. Up that, <laughs> I don't start know taking the wife's car hunting so me, no one recognizes your truck. <laughs> let me let me let you know this right now, and I'll tell this out to the public. If I show if I show Steve a picture of a one fifty that I got, and he can hunt that property, you damn right, Skippy, that boy's gonna be in there trying to kill that deer. Like oh. nothing's safe at that point. You, bro. Listen, you <laughs> come you on. Can show, you, sh you can flash me some one twenty fives, maybe even a one thirty. Our friendship's safe, but you show me a one fifty, dude, our friendship's in jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. it's damn truth though i mean like let's be honest like i can't what happened to the what happened to the outdoor drive they, they, they don't do it no more nah dude they're gonna fight over 150 dude. <laughs> i guess it's worthy of that right 150 i guess i'll, I'll take it dude i'll definitely take it Justin, in our neck of the woods for sure i guess that's where social media comes into play where like you know guys you have to definitely keep your mouth shut because social media a lot of people there's a lot of trollers on there like a lot of people are oh. trolling they're they're oh. they're looking to chase the report not make the report and like guys like us are making the report not chasing the report and that's that's where you probably have a lot of problems social media is your worst enemy because never mind will people try to find it maybe some people even have a picture of that deer not mm. as recent and you just gave them the last piece of the puzzle saying oh jimmy's over there and he's posting them too. Ah, he's working this way, so I need to reset. Kills the deer. So you don't want to. Social media is just yeah. You just follow, follow our videos of the year recap. Don't worry about it now. <laughs> <laughs> he's already dead. <laughs> he's already no. dead. The other problem with social media, and I say this all the time, is that social media makes it so that you're not liable to get punched in the mouth. So like <laughs> you can no. you can say no. or do whatever you want. Like if you're if you're going into somebody's spot. And you're finding it on social media or you're sharing those trail cam pictures of a buck that you're after, they can be put anywhere. It's mm -hmm. it's ridiculous. And that's where I get mad yep. about it. And like it's kind of a catch twenty two for us, right? Because we have a podcast, we have a YouTube, mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. social media content that goes out all the time and like we have to be very stringent on what we do because we could slip up and make a mistake because every single one of us is chasing a big buck. And it is liable to get shot. So, like, we just don't want anybody to know about it. That's definitely a negative. Nothing Def personal. Nothing personal. No, it's not. It's not. But it is, it is what it is. Um, that The deer that you shot last year, your big buck, was mm -hmm. there other deer, ch other people chasing that buck? Did you know about that buck? Like, tell oh. us a little bit about it. We, I hunted with my buddy Joe. You guys know Joe. Mm-hmm. We got that property on November 10th. Don't quote me on the dates, but it was a Wednesday or something. Lady said, just want you to split some wood, yada, yada, yada. Go set your camera, do whatever you want. So it was a Sunday. We were splitting wood in the rain all day. Set cameras. That Monday, I work nights, so I had the Monday off. That Monday, I go to where I think it's juice. You know what I mean? Like, awesome. Like, truck way in my climber i'm sweating i had to stop out of shed layers it's raining i'm like this is brutal whatever get there i think i'm in the money nothing hike all the way back out i think joey sat once maybe or twice that week that was the monday he sat twice and then one of the cameras was on fire with does and i got out of work on a thursday night sat on a friday morning and was there for 10 minutes and i had him come off the hill and 12 yards smoked and watched them go down it was 
the best morning in the hunt, hunting woods I've ever had. It was amazing. And, and you had that deer on camera prior, or no? You've never seen this oh, no. deer, never nothing. We had cameras soaking for five to five days, and only one of them went off with three pitches of does within like an hour sequence. I was there's two. There's, I don't want to give away too much, but there's two different sides to this property. And I was going to go, I was like, you know what? I thought I knew where I was going to go. So that morning on the Friday, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go way on the other side. And that's when Joey called me up. He's like, no, 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 no. The does are flying around this side. So I'm like, all right, whatever. I'll go over here, set up. And the stars went in a straight line. That's awesome, dude. What was the feeling? I know, like, we know, we've seen the videos. But, like, I couldn't imagine shooting a buck of that caliber in New England alone. Like, that's a giant. Well, it was my first year filming, so it was like, I'm just starting to get in a groove with, you know, screw this in, GoPro, screw that in, get this ready, blah, blah, blah. So my bow is in the third-hand archery holder and my climber. I screw in my camera arm. I don't have the camera on yet, so I screw in a little pick for the GoPro, and I'm clipping the GoPro on the pick as I'm hugging the tree, basically, to explain it better. And I just catch movement where i'm looking I, my bow's behind me and i just see antlers i'm like like big antlers i'm like oh you gotta be kidding me so i do like the michael jackson one foot like 180 <laughs> grab the bow and i still don't want to turn the full like 270 you know what i mean i so i look out of the corner of my eye just looking the opposite way i'm like oh my god let's go dude you know hook the hook the d-loop draw and he comes he came right down no idea I, I'm, I'm like Meh looks the other way again i'm like let's go dude housing bubble pull through smash bang dude it was amazing that's awesome. i couldn't stop speaking. and the worst part was man there is zero service at this place i wanted to call my dad i wanted to call my buddies i wanted to call everybody and it would it would get to them and they'd be like hello and i'll be like you're not gonna buy it and then it would go it would call field i'm like oh oh kidding me man but so it's totally it was, opposite from the 10 point that you shot in the bushes. Like it's totally out. You can't call oh, nobody. You can't text nobody. Nothing. Nothing, dude. Nothing. That was the worst part about it. Not being, I was alone. You know what I mean? So what you saw on camera, me by myself is what I had to experience with until I got it out and everyone came. We were drinking all night, but it was good. That's what it is. That's, that's the camaraderie of it. I mean, you you I, want everybody to come help you, but in the same token, like sometimes it's nice, and especially that's obviously your biggest whitetail, right? I mean, like oh, hands yeah. down. Oh, yeah. So like to oh. have that memory with that deer one on one could have it was probably a reason for it, like that I, sentimental. There on my for an hour, just inspecting. There was there was buttholes and just tines, little kicker, and just the mass and where he was rubbing and. Perfect shot placement. I'm lifting the leg. I'm looking at this. It, it was, like I said, I sat there for an hour just in awe. Just wanted to, want to pause life right there for like four hours and bring everyone there and just sit there and look. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you, you easily could have walked out and then called everyone. Wait, you wouldn't have, you couldn't have pulled me out of there with a winch. I wasn't leaving that <laughs> private property but i'm like i can't i i think i walked away 15 yards at one point to try to go get something in my truck and i, I turned back around and i can't leave the deer <laughs> i'm not walking away <laughs> couldn't happen so you dragged the thing out on on your own uh i called a buddy i got up i got up to the top of the hill and there's a local kid real good kid he came i mean it was a dude it was friday morning 10 o'clock everybody's at work everybody mm. Yeah, so he, I don't know, was off or something, came with a jet sled. That, so the ending of my video, you see us dragging him out in the jet sled. He came, and he was a huge help. Oh, that's so awesome, dude. There's nothing better uh, than that. That's just something else. It's incredible. It it happened as quick as possible because if I sat there and watched that deer for a long period of time, I think it, pro it wouldn't have went. I still would have executed, but it would have been harder. I didn't have time to think. I didn't have time to even like look at what he was. Not he he came in on a full trot, so it was get around, draw, shoot, boom. It was over in ten seconds since I when I saw him, when the shot was. <laughs> <laughs> you hoping to do it again this year? Oh my god, twice if we can, but yeah. one will be good. And if it's not, <laughs> it, it's not as easy as do it again. So I mean, if we do, it's a blessing. If not, we're gonna give it hell. 
Yeah, and and that's and that's and the, you're at that point in your career where it, it's it's a it's all or nothing, right? It's it's all yep. or bust. I mean, it's you're gonna chase that specific deer that you want to chase or that quality of deer, and if you don't make it, then it is what it is. And yep, I think it's it shows a lot. Like for example, a lot of people know that Marduk does that. And that now they're going to know that you do that because you could go to three seasons without taking a deer or the deer of the quality that you want. And the guys are like, where's Barnes? Where's Mardik? But when it yep. happens, everybody remembers that big deer that you shot. And it's it's crazy because they'll be like, oh, and it, you see the, the other thing that comes along with it is guys are like, oh, yeah, well, you didn't shoot a deer last year. Yeah, but the deer that I shot the year before was subpar 140, 150. Yep. yep. And I, I passed more 120s than you shot in your yeah. life. Like, that's where... Yeah. This, Bingo. It's going to be having that Sony up in the tree this year. Mm-hmm. I wish I started so much earlier than I did, because a lot of people would be like, oh, well, you haven't killed anything yet. Or like the newer people like, oh, you haven't shot anything yet. It's like, I'm going to kill more deer with the camera this year mm-hmm. than you're going to read about. And I can't wait for it because that's going to all put it into perspective with everyone when you have 15 minutes of beautiful footage of these deer right in the wheelhouse. And yeah, I might not shoot, but I killed them with the camera and that's all right. that matters. And, and it's not it's not a disrespect thing, right? Because you shoot what you want and your re- your reward is what you want it to be, right? Like it's not – we're not talking down on people for shooting 110s or 120s and I make this very clear – it's where you are in the point of your career, what you want to do, to and to what to shoot what you want. It's it's one of those things. Like if I want to shoot, and listen, I I shoot one ten all day. It's just because I like shooting shit. That's just me. I'm I just I I have a tough time. I've never passing. seen a one ten spike buck. <laughs> you, you watch your mouth over there, big guy. <laughs> Remember uh, that dude Keith that came at the end of the night? He should has like Keith, what's his, uh, Reagan maybe his last name? And Where was this? Killed, this was in Springfield at the end of the night. Oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah. He's killed like a hundred. I, I don't don't quote me on the word. Hundreds of deer plus, and he'll shoot anything. He he shot the biggest mm-hmm. of the big. He'll shoot a spike on the opener this year. You know what I mean? He's in it for the meat, and we respect it all. Yeah, and those two guys are madmen. Like that's uh, what what was whoa, what was whoa, the whoa, reference? Whoa, we're throwing this madman around, yeah. around like it's like candy tonight. Like yeah, come whatever. on, like, whatever. Like, yeah. what the? You're subpar, bro. Subpar. <laughs> no, um, I'm the OG, son. Those guys are crazy. <laughs> like like the two of them. What was it? Dan Infall and uh, what what did we reference? John Eberhart. Yeah, John Eberhart and <laughs> and Dan Infall. Uh, what's the other Gallagher? Gallagher? Yeah, Jim Gallagher. Jim Gallagher. Oh, I love those guys. They're oh, killers. They awesome. Absolute killers, oh. man. Like that's and they've shot tons and tons of deer. The big of the big and just whatever they feel that they want to shoot. They just love shooting deer. And they'll come up and tell you, I shot 137 oh. deer in my career. Like yeah. and they're not all yeah. monsters, but anyways, going back to what I was saying is that you you set your goal and your goal is what your goal is, man. Cuz you're at that point in your career where you're just a crazy trophy whitetail hunter f- in new england i mean it just it just is yeah. what it is don't get it twisted with the whole inch thing like oh he's not going to shoot anything that's 120 inches if i have a 105 inch big coke can based thick no tine giant i'm shooting him he'll be a number one big mature mm. buck so it's not, it's, there's not an inch per se persona about it it's more of a an age thing with bigger mature deer and right one of the things that we don't talk about a lot in new england is and when you talk to people like all right a lot of people in new england they talk weight like connecticut is an inch thing right a lot of guys talk inches inches we don't have that big body deer we do but we don't and it starts to blend in but you start getting into mass new hampshire vermont and maine that's when those guys go how big was your biggest deer oh 215 pounds 225 pounds, 235 pounds. Like that's all they care about. The inch thing is not, not, it's not a bragging, right? It's more of the poundage. Like you said it, you said it. That first 10 point buck was how many pounds? It was, I think it was 222. Yeah. And you knew that weight. Like if you asked me how much my deer weighed, I couldn't tell you what a deer weighed. I never weigh a deer. 
I don't know, just never really done it. It's just not a thing. But the more north you get in the nor- in New England, a lot of guys go by the weight. The weight is 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 the is the the reward. Yep, it's funny. You'll show you'll go up north, like even when we went to turkey camp or something. You'll show a great deer, and they don't ask the score. Oh, what it weigh? You know what's the weight? You know what I mean? They don't care. So <laughs> they don't care at all. <laughs> yeah, you know? one hundred and forty four pounds. <laughs> that's not that big. <laughs> yeah, I shot a one forty four. Yeah, that's not on, a big deer. On back to the day, my deer last year scored more than it weighed. Skin and bone. What's it? It what? It's it scored more than its weight. It was it was like a hundred and fifty. Well, it was almost exact. It was like one hundred and fifty one pounds dressed up. Come on, really? Yeah, it all rutted out, man. Just he running. was the he. Was the yeah, what, he was. The what boss. was the date? November eighteenth. Mm. That's late. Mm, like some good. That's some good killing days in there. Oh, it is. For yeah, sure. if he's if, if he's the if he's the king of the castle, think of those does. The first does that come in, you're talking. I mean, first week of October, we get those mature does that no one even tries to pick up on because they're like, oh, it's too early. Uh-uh. He's out there somewhere, and he's with her. You know what I mean? He's got her pinned did, down. Did you somewhere. have good? Did you have good acorns last year or no? No. Yeah, that that's a factor there too. Yep, I think. Um, well, he had he had some like gore holes in him when he was getting dressed out and skinned out, so he was fighting and he wasn't he wasn't looking too good, but sealed the deal. Someone had to put him out of his misery. Yep, might exactly. as well be you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It looks like there's going to be good acorns this year, dude. Well, I got, I mean, I think it's an every other year thing. I have an apple tree and last year, I don't even think it dropped even a sprout. The year before I had probably 50 jet sleds of apples. And then this year, same thing. You can't even see the leaves. It's all apples again. So I don't know. I think acorn might, is it every three? There's a mass crop. Depends on if it's red or white. Yeah. So, I mean. Last year there was there was nothing, so I mean I'm assuming this year is going to be a little better. Well, well what's your opinion on that? Do you, is it do you look at it as a good thing or a bad thing? Because you hear both sides. Some people bitch and moan that there's no acorns. Some people think it's a good thing. I, I've got my my thoughts on it, but what's yours? I got um I got like a fifty fifty approach. I think it's great for the deer, the protein source, putting on weight before the winter. Like it's great for them. On the other hand. They don't got to move. You get a you get a mature deer, and he's tucked away in his own swamp, his own little square mile that he's hanging out in, and he just has his trees in the thicket, and he ain't coming out. So right. that's the sucky part. Yeah, yeah, I could never figure that out because you, you'll see a lot of guys, especially on the social media, like complaining they're having a bad season and they're blaming it on no acorns. And <clears throat> in my opinion, that means the deer are moving more from feed to bed to find, you know, to whatever the next food source is, it in theory, it should make it easier. Right. But I think at the end of the day, you have to be prepared either way. You, you have to know how to hunt on a good acorn year. You need to know how to hunt on a bad acorn year and not get stuck on hunting the same way every single year. Because when the variables come, that's when you're going to have, you're going to have bad years. If you're not hunting based on the mass crop for that year. Yep, well, you get a lot of people, they'll shoot a great deer, that one tree, that one spot, and they're, they're, they're glued. They won't move. They're like, this is it. Right. I figured it out. This is the tree. This is the run. This is, yeah, that was the run in 2018. You know, you got to you gotta move. You got to, you might have killed that one buck who liked to live right there. You got to, you got to bang around a bit and stir some stuff up. Sometimes you jump them out, but it is what it is. You learn and you keep going. Well, that's one of the things that I find here, like hunting in, like, you have mountain laurel too, like hunting mountain laurel here. Like, if you can find a white oak tree in the mountain laurels, like, sit on that tree that's producing because they're going to come to it and that buck might not be bedded too far from it. Especially if you have a, a water source, a food source, and a bedding source, like, that could be the one area that you can pick off and hunt constantly in those years that are off years when they're not having those crops then 
it's not a good hunting area. And everybody, like you just said, swears on that one spot, that one stand. I killed my biggest buck here. Yeah, but that deer's dead. Now it's time to move on to, like, historically, yep. yes, deer will come back to the same area. It's obviously a good terrain or it's a good area for them to hide and so on and so forth. But it might not be good for two, three more years until you get that proper crop in that area. Right. And it makes it super tough. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's one of the guessing games that you have to figure out. One of the ads to to those areas, like you said, like looking for pinch points and stuff. You have to also look for the crops in that area and the food sources and all that. I mean, oak swamps, oak ridges are the best, don't you know? Like that's just the best place to be. Oh my god! Mm. <laughs> well, well, on that term, you can go on your um, topo maps and find a pinch point or a funnel or something like that. Well, what's on either end of that funnel? If it's not bedding and food, if the, you know, that funnel could go nowhere. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean deer never going to use it. You, you need more than just a funnel and a pinch point. If you can find bedding on one side, food on the other with a pinch point in the middle, then you're in the game, but there's more to it than just finding a spot on the map that has a train feature because you need destinations to have it hold value. Exactly. Yep. I so, think. Oh, go ahead, Justin. No, it's just it's a lot of people like here. Here's the phone. If you were gonna if you're gonna sit a spot, drop me a pin. But I'll drop you a pin. But that entails two weekends of walking around, a soaking camera for two months, uh, me moving this. I might move the camera on the other side of the ridge. It, it, you gotta pick it apart. It's not just like oh that looks good. I'm just gonna set a stand. You know what I mean? There's more to it that people don't want to put the work in and they're like, Oh, this sucks. But you just gotta, as Stevie says, I'll work the next guy. Well, the other thing, I think another thing that adds to that is I think that it's more important to find the areas that are not good than the areas that are good. So like oh, yeah. putting, putting, putting time and effort into a spot to find out that it's not good so that you're not focusing your time there than putting your time in there and it being not good. You know what I'm saying? Dude. Like, more times than not, I would I look at it on top. I'm like, this is money, absolute money. You get there, you look around, you're like, this place sucks. <laughs> it's like, the worst. Oh, it's the worst. You lose Wasted sleep Saturday. Over it. I'm never going back there again. Yep. Yeah. You lose but, sleep right. over it just to go to that one spot, and you go there, and there's not even a deer drop, and you're like, not even a doe comes through this place, dude. This place is useless. Junk. It's the worst. And that's one of the problems with big woods. Like, we hunt big woods. Like, that's tough. It's super tough to pin to pinpoint those areas because there's 10 pinch points, 10 oak flats. You know what I'm saying? And you have to now find in one piece, in one parcel of land. And you're like, okay, now which one's the good one? Now yeah. you got to put well, all your time in it. Your wife gets sick of, what do you want for your birthday? And I'm like, oh, trail cameras. She's like, really? More cameras? <laughs> I'm like, you need more, man. You got to spread these things. You <laughs> never have enough. <laughs> no. Nope. What happens? Okay, so like De- Delaware. Delaware just outlawed trail cameras. What happens if that happens here? Yeah, this is going to be personal time in the tree that you're using up now. So <laughs> it's going to be honey, tough. Honey, what do you want for your birthday? More time in the tree. <laughs> <laughs> more time. But it's. Oh, that's what, awesome. what did Delaware do away with? cameras all together just on public i don't know it was just i didn't really read into it but i just saw that they there was a proposed ban on trail cameras so i don't know the whole the whole truth to it um but it it goes back in a lot of things where a lot of people don't the woodsmanship the woodsmanship is the key thing here because if Mm. and we talk about this a lot in the podcast is A lot of the newer generations don't have that woodsmanship. Like you, Justin, you were born and raised hunting and fishing, so you have that woodsmanship. Steve has it, I have it, a lot of us do, but the newer hunters and the newer generations, or the lazy hunters, they're they're focusing on using those trail cameras and don't understand the woodsmanship of the woods, of going in the woods and finding deer. They're banking all their time and effort on that trail camera to have it to do all the work for them when if you didn't have it and had to take it away. And that's where, go ahead. Well, I was, no, finish that thought. I'm sorry. No, I where, mean, where I wouldn't, I honestly, you know, I wouldn't be against like, um, some type of band where you can't use it during hunting season. You can only use it preseason. 
You know what I'm saying? Like I'd be okay with that. Use it as a scouting yeah. tool, but you can't use it during season. If they, you know, if they were to shut it down September or October, you know what I'm saying? Because I get we what they're the saying. Same. Go ahead. We have the same day. If you get a, if you get a trail cam picture at that spot of a specific, I don't know, you can't really put a specific deer on it, but you're really not allowed to go to that tree and kill. You got to wait a full day. What is that's a rule that you have? Yeah, up in New Hampshire. Same oh, day. that's a law. Yeah, same what day. If rule. You're, what if you're already in the tree and you and you get a picture? I think that no, yeah, no, you're already there. Mm. So that's M- actually a just... law. You can't go and hunt it that day that you see. It's that... so, the same day rule. It's similar to up in Alaska. You yeah, can't, you can't hunt the same day you fly. Yeah, I didn't even know that New Hampshire had that law. That's crazy. It... Yeah, it's tough. It's, but where's it's it's all ethics though. Like who's gonna who's gonna how do you get bagged for that? Like that's on yeah. the individual hunter to do the right thing because there's no there's no way to enforce that. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a gray area for sure. Mm. And that's one of those things though. Like like Boone and Crockett and Pope and Young, they were they were also on that fair chase thing where they shouldn't be able to. Um, Deer shouldn't be recognized if you have your camera on instant. So if you have instant feed on your camera and you go and shoot the deer the same day, it shouldn't be recognized as a Pope and Young or a Boone and Crockett because it's not technically fair <laughs> chase. With that being said, I, I mean I love my cell cameras because I'm fin- like I don't I like this low pressure as possible. I hate going in like guys check camera before cell cameras. Guys would check cameras way too much. They were going in there every day, every other day, just to see what came overnight. And I'm a soaker. Um, with that being said, if they did something with cell cameras where I only got pictures once a day the day before, I'd be perfectly fine with it. I don't need I don't need the picture the second it gets taken. I I will have them send them instant, but. It wouldn't be the end of the world for me. I'll I'll take get, send me all my pictures tomorrow morning. I don't care as long as I don't have to go in there and pull the card to see what's going on. I'm perfectly fine with that. A lot of people realize that you need to be there when that camera's taking that picture if it's a daylight photo. A lot of people will be like, "Oh, he was there. I uh, tomorrow morning I'm in there. He's there. He's already through there. He's gone. You want to be there when that camera's going off, not get the picture then go." It's so it's like you said, if you got all the pictures once a day at eight o'clock at night when you're eating dinner, I'm cool with that. Right. So going along with that, though, you hear a lot of guys that are rut hunters, like big time rut hunters. And they'll say, if you get a picture of a deer, say that you get a picture of your number one deer and it's in there chasing a doe or whatever, that you have three days to get in there and kill that deer. Like in that three day, he's going to stay in that block of timber within three days. Right. Like. That's one thing that you hear, right? Like guys would say, if I get a picture of, of my number one hit lister, I have three days to try and kill that deer because that deer is only going to be in that block of timber for three days or in that correlated or that, that area. Maybe. Or it could be three <laughs> fucking miles away. <laughs> uh, I wish I was that good. No. So I I bet I can tell you where that – I bet you where that came from. That comes from early rut – First doe in estrus, lockdown. He goes into the thicket. He stay hangs with her for three days. She goes into estrus. He breeds her, and she's gone. Right. That's probably where that came from. Aside from that, bullshit. Well, that's yeah. Right. That goes along also when it comes to cameras. Guys gets a picture at two o'clock in the morning. They're like, I gotta get in there. That deer is seventeen miles away from oh where your camera is. They're like, I'm gonna get him tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Like. Yeah, Opening you might. Day, September, September, September fifteenth. Yeah, you, yeah. You, love it. You might. Uh, you, got- you might, right? You might, but the odds are. I mean, you got a, like a fifteen percent, twenty five percent chance that that deer is going to be there. If he's there at three in the Listen morning, that. you're going right. <laughs> you're going in there <laughs> at six. He's already three hours away. How long can you? How far can you walk in three hours? Yeah. yeah. Well, this is how I look at it. All right, you you can, even if it's reg, you've got them on camera regularly, every day or every night, I should say, at three in the morning, you've got this buck on camera every day at three in the morning. The camera's twenty five yards from your tree stand. 
You think you're going to go in there opening day and he's going to walk up by a shooting light on September 15th? It ain't happening. I mean, maybe, maybe, but you've never gotten a picture of him in the daylight. And now he's on been- September 15th, he's going to walk by at 530 at night? Probably not happening. You're not even no. close. No. You and and that's and you see all these stories with guys that shoot big bucks. They have tons of pictures of deer in the daylight to be able to kill mm. that deer in daylight. It's 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 that deer might be in some type of rotation that he comes through that property every three days or wherever in that area. But it's not during the day. You need to get on his circle where it is in the day. You need to have 25 pictures of him in the day. One picture is not going to do it. You have to have 10, 15 pictures of him in the daylight. Then I would be in belief that you would shoot that deer on September 15th. But it, other mm-hmm. than that, you know, and that's that's where it's a different it's a different game. It's a totally different game. And I think that that's I where... Think, huh? Go ahead. I think... <laughs> On a simple side of things, I think that really goes back to like the whole Dan Infolt thing is in how in relation to bedding. So if you're hunting evenings, that buck's going to get up out of his bed close to dark. He's not going to travel far before it gets to dark. Okay. Well, now your camera's three, 400 yards away, closer to the food source. Everybody wants to put their cameras near the food source because that's where you get more pictures, you get more intel, you get more deer, yada, yada, yada. Well, you're not going to kill that big buck. I mean, I'm not saying you're not going to, but the chances of getting that big buck early season that far away from bedding is a lot lower than back closer to the bedding. Yep. Because you're closer to bedding, you're more likely to catch them when the sun's still up. Yep. Justin, are you more of a bed guy, a food guy? What do you, or are you a pinch guy? Um. So, like, early, I'll, like, I'll fringe hunt. Two years ago, I shot. Was it two years ago? Yeah, my second biggest. I fringe hunted this one spot twice. I could hear him get up, walk within 50 yards, and then it's no shooting light. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right under my tree, I'm throttling a saplings. The, the saplings hitting his horns. I'm like, oh my God, can't get down. So I had to let him filter through, happened twice. So I'm like, you know what? This is this is where we, we move and groove. So down the down the drainage I went and I got within fifty yards of his bedding that next night I shot him, twenty yards, broad daylight. He was just getting up, working that edge of that swamp, and right when we can't see down our peep, he comes up the drainage. So all I had to do was dive in on a good wind and he did the same thing and bang. So I'll fringe hunt, get some intel. I won't go straight to the bed. No, it's, I mean, some people do, and they're really good at it, but I don't have the confidence in that yet. So I'll let them tell me kind of what's going on, and then I'll make my move. And if not, it's more of I'll just slowly chip away, go down, go down, unless a deer like that tells me exactly what's going on. I'll try to kill him. Nope. By fringe, you're talking about like the transition line between bedding and hardwoods? Yeah. I'm like I'm talking hundred yards off bedding. Not far. I'm still right. in the ball game. If they can yeah. make it up in time, I'll kill them. But I I don't want to go like I can't even find a tree any further to climb because it's too thick or like I'm not gonna get that close. Right. Unless it's go time. Guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna break away for two seconds. I'm watching this guy who was catching those pumpkin seed. He's literally banging the pumpkin seed up against the fence to get it off the hook because he doesn't want to touch the fish to take it off. So he's literally swinging it up against the fence to have it come off the hook. And he's so mad because it's so hooked so well. He's done it about twenty five times and it hasn't come the off the hook yet. Travel hook has every single lip done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to just add that. Now he's got it back in the water, hoping it will fall off. <laughs> like the thing's dead, bro. Sorry, I just I was very entertained by this movement. <laughs> Justin, what's your favorite time? Give me like a week window or four or five day window. Like, what are you rut hunter? Are you like early season, late season uh, killer? Like what? October twenties. Yeah, Ultimate, he'll catch a buck in his home core. He'll be moving around at night, but usually comes back to the same spot. Not crazy, killable, 
that between my fam, like my father's history, my history, those October twenties is they're getting up when it's still light out, and they start getting riled up, and they will push some limits in the daylight where you can kill them. But so but, predictable. Yep, exactly predictable. Because once you get into the rut, man, it's kind of there's no rhyme or reason. You just put yourself in the woods, and if it happens, it happens, and if it doesn't, it's late season time. You know what I mean? I would honestly say December hunting for me is better than rut hunting. Karen, <laughs> battle, <laughs> <on, please. laughs> Oh, uh, is, laughing. Is, is everybody knows all my friends you guys obviously like i hate the cold i am like the most cold person ever but i'm always the last guy in the tree end of december everyone's at christmas parties like you're going hunting like what are you doing i'm like bet your ass i'm going hunting because it's two degrees it's sleet and rain and these deer I don't can. like yep i was like moving I was laughing at your story earlier when you were talking about packing your climber and you were sweating and you were hot. And I was like, I've never heard you say you were hot and sweating in my life. It's always, I'm freezing, Karen. I'm freezing. This, oh. this is the oh, kid at turkey camp the, la- the last week of May, first week of June, and he's wearing heat boost. What are you oh. doing, bro? I was and until we started, me and... Jimmy Black started running around midday, and then I was like, "All right, this is- it was hot that day too." <laughs> this is- I'm sweating now. <laughs> so, speaking of that, fun fact about Justin: he is probably the most avid bow hunter that we know. I mean, stubborn. Is that fair to say, stubborn? Dude, 100%. stubborn bow hunter. Oh, yeah. Except, except when we dragged you to turkey camp this year and convinced you to bust out. Bust out some boomsticks. So why don't you, why don't you talk about that Dude, a little bit? You guys opened uh, another can of worms. It was like, at what point was I hooked on hunt? And I gave you that story. Now it's like, at what point? You'll, we'll talk about this in five years. What point did you get hooked to guns? And I went <laughs> to go back to uh, opening day hunt with Trev and Seth. And I threw some saddies about 55 yards away. I watched a bird crumble. And I looked at Trev. I'm like, that was amazing. Amazing. <laughs> Dude, it was one of the funnest things I've ever done. I'm like, I don't even want to shoot a bird with a bow anymore. It's like, that was so, so enjoyable because the, the previous month of that, I was running and gunning, self-filming my bow. And I mean, I was getting super close, but I was getting super irritated at the same time. It's like, dude, I was like, this should be a dead bird. Like, this should be a dead bird. I'm like, you know what? Up to camp. I'm not bringing my bow. I text you guys. I'm like, who's got a gun? Right. I'm shooting gun. So, so just to clarify, like we're not exaggerating. That turkey that you shot in Maine was the first animal you've killed with a gun in your life. Yep. I've only shot a gun either into the woods at a target or at a, a target range. Right. Oh, it's incredible. Right. Oh, it's then you throw in the, the adrenaline aspect, the gun, the whole nine, bead, half bead, back up to barrel. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> You look, you see a couple running, but you see one on the ground. Like, <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, well, not one, but but two. And, yeah. and we got and we and we got you in, on the night hunt, which is uh, I still I got adrenaline coming out my eyeballs. <laughs> oh, but that night hunt is something that I mean, you guys, whoever's listening that hasn't hunted before, you can skip the deer and the turkey man, just go straight to night hunting, dude. <laughs> that was. I've dude, I've spent a lot of time fishing and hunting and that was one of the funnest times I've ever had in the outdoors. And to have everyone by our side, the friends and then Timmy and Seth who are basically their buddies now, it, it was it was awesome. I could have stayed out there, just paused and just let's drive around Maine and try to kill every guy that we can. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you were definitely hooked. I mean, you shot a turkey at fifty-five yards with a shotgun, which most people don't don't do. First off, rolled it, I like, and then I remember Powered the look. Saddies. Yeah, po- dude, that is no. Even Seth, Seth, Seth Edwards from two hundred seven. He was like, dude. He's like, he hit me up after, and he was like, bro, um, does Adam, does Aaron make, um. Does he make coyote rounds? Because what I saw do a turkey, I think I need some of those for coyotes, he said. <laughs> <laughs> Working on it. Hell yeah. Actually, Aaron just messaged me while we were on the podcast. He did. He, he messaged me too, actually. Um, 
But no, dude, I'm I'm glad that you got the you know, you kind of put down your barrier and took out the gun, dude, because it makes it a lot more fun. It really does. It adds to it. I mean, turkeys I and we say this, turkeys were born to get shot in the face. I mean, it's just the way that it goes, dude. They that's that's what they were that's what God put them on this earth for is to get shot in the face with a shotgun. I mean, that's literally what they're for, dude. And it's no joke. There will be a gun purchased at the end of the year. <laughs> <laughs> Ready for spring, next spring. I'm coming up to watch you do that again because that would definitely be priceless. Oh, I'm going to Connecticut Turkey Camp. I'm going to Maine Turkey Camp. Anywhere I can where I can freaking blast, I'm going. <laughs> I'm there. Well, I'll meet I'll meet you in Mass first because I'm planning on coming there for your opener. Same, so we'll, have same. To, we'll have to link up that Monday. Yep, let's do it. Trev, did you did you open that message? We should probably plug that a little bit. The, no, I did. Didn't. I was in the middle of doing this. I'm afraid that my 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 phone's gonna die. So go ahead. What was it? So uh, uh, everyone should make sure you're going over there and check out uh, Sadie's ammunition because it looks like some swags coming. It uh, looks like a nice Sadie's T-shirt, and on the back it says. When the saddies are flying, the birds are dying. Oh. So make sure you check out because it looks like those are going to be available soon. Cool. That's sure. awesome. Got to love them, dude. Well, Justin, man, we really appreciate you jumping on with us, buddy. But um, before you take off, can you just tell us uh, what drives you outdoors? <laughs> it is my getaway from work. I mean, we work 2,000 hours a year. It's stressful. It's my getaway from the house. Anyone who hasn't experienced the woods waking up or going to bed, it's the most relaxing thing that you can experience. Even if you don't shoot anything, you see raccoons, squirrels, birds flying onto your arrow, something you're not seeing from the couch. And it's just my way to get away from everything. I love it, dude. I absolutely love it. Uh, if you guys want to see Justin, you can check him out on all of our YouTube page, and you can also check him out on Instagram and Facebook. Why don't you plug in there wh- where where they can find you on Instagram? Uh, underscore Justin Barnes is the Instagram. I don't post too much on there, but definitely follow the Outdoor Drive. Instagram and YouTube, that's where I post most of my stuff. And hopefully you guys enjoy the ride. That, um... That hunt from that Justin told earlier in the podcast of his buck from last year is up there currently if you guys want to check it out. For sure, and I'll, I'll make sure to put a plug in there so you guys can watch that on the link below. And uh, everybody else, thanks for taking the ride right here on the Outdoor Drive.